So today we're going to learn about chi-squared test, and we're going to talk about goodness of fit test, independence, homogeneity. Uh, so there's a few different tests, and we're going to learn them all together because they're all very, very similar. So a chi-squared test is a statistical test for categorical data. So you may already be used to categorical data when doing z-tests for proportions, right? So we might have seen questions like, we want to ask, is this coin fair? And you see some data where we flip a coin 100 times and get 55 heads and 45 tails. And here there are only two categories, right? We call this binary data. So if we have binary data, we typically use a z-test rather than a chi-squared test. And we have a test statistic, a z statistic, which measures our observed minus expected values over a standard error. And this test statistic measures how far what we observed is from what we expected. And specifically, we measure how the proportion of heads or tails differed from what we expected to see. And we only have to do this for the proportion of heads or tails because the proportion of tails is implicitly defined by the proportion of heads. So we only have to compute the z statistic once, and it doesn't really matter if we're talking about the probability of heads or the probability of tails, because they're two sides of the same coin. But what if we have more than two categories? We might want to ask, is this die fair? So we can't do a z-test because there are so many different observed and expected quantities. And even if we just chose one of the quantities, that doesn't really define what happened with all of the rest of the quantities because there's so many of them. So we can't really compute a Z statistic. There are more than two categories, so we should use a chi-squared test. So what are chi-squared tests? They are named because they involve chi-squared distributions, which we'll see. And chi-squared distributions arise when we have sums of squares. So we'll see where we're calculating sums of squares. And when people talk about chi-square tests, they typically mean a very specific set of tests for categorical data, which are all very similar. Chi-squared distributions are used uh, elsewhere in statistics too, but if you just hear chi-square test, you can pretty much assume it's gonna be one of the tests we're talking about today. So we have a goodness of fit test, and we also have test of independence and homogeneity, which we'll see are really the same test. So let's get started. The simplest chi-square test is called a goodness of fit test. And the first question is, we are testing the goodness of fit of what? What fit? And we are testing that a certain distribution fits the observed data. So for any statistical test, we must start out with a default assumption, which we call the null hypothesis. So for our die, our default assumption is going to be that it's a regular fair die. Each option has probability one out of six, okay? So when we have the null hypothesis, such as the die is fair, this implies a distribution that the probability of every outcome is one out of six. And as a further consequence of this, if I roll the die 60 times, I expect to see approximately 10 of each outcome but I may see more or I may see less, right? So this is what we would expect to see, 10 of each outcome of the die on 60 rolls. However, then we are gonna collect some data. This is our observed data. And it's not going to look exactly like we would expect, right? We're never gonna see exactly 10 of each outcome. And our question is, is what we observed far enough away from what we expected to be suspicious of the die being fair? So we can see we observed more ones and fives than we expected, but we observed less twos and threes. But are these differences big enough where we should really be worried? Well, I don't know. We'll have to do a statistical test to find out. We need a way to measure how far the observed and expected data are, just like we have for a z-test. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna compute this thing called a chi-squared statistic which is going to be calculated by summing over all categories. And we're going to sum up the observed minus expected values squared divided by the expected values. So we call this the chi-squared statistic. And probability theory allows us to show that the distribution of this test statistic, if the die is fair, if the null hypothesis is true, is something called a chi-squared distribution, which tends to look like a right-skewed distribution like this. So what does a chi-square distribution exactly look like? Well, the smallest possible value is zero because we are squaring things and adding them up. So we can never get a negative value. Small values are less weird 
because that means what we observed and what we expected are very close together, so we get a small value. And large values are more weird, because that means what we observed and what we expected are far away from each other. Okay, so the least weird result possible is that the test statistic is zero, and that would only happen if what we observed and what we expected was the same. Now, on the other hand, these results would be extremely weird, where we see all ones. Then what we observed and what we expected are very, very far apart. And the results that we saw are somewhere in between. They are a little weird, but should we be suspicious? So let's calculate the chi-squared test statistic. So our first part of this is going to be the observed minus expected, so 15 minus 10 squared over expected, which was 10. Okay, and we're going to do that for all six categories. So this is what our chi-squared test statistic is going to look like. And when we add up all those numbers, we get 12.4. Now the question is, is 12.4 weird? Well, large values are more weird, but we need to define what is too big by finding something called a critical value, which is the cutoff for being too big, right? So a common critical value for a z-test is the commonly used 1.96. However, for a chi-square test, we'll have different critical values depending on the number of categories. And this leads us to something called the degrees of freedom. So our test statistic is summed over all of the categories. So if we have more categories, we're adding more things up. And we need to take this into account when we consider what statistic is considered too big. So this is called the degrees of freedom, which is equal to the number of categories minus one, right? If we had 100 categories, we'd be adding up a lot of things. And then what we would consider too big would be a bigger number. So we need to take into account the number of categories. So here we had a die. So we had six categories. So six minus one is equal to five. So we have five degrees of freedom. So we can find critical values, the cutoff values for the statistic being too big, and we can find these in a table in a statistics textbook or online. So this is an example of what something like this might look like. So if the statistic is bigger than the critical value, we're going to reject the null hypothesis. And we said we have five degrees of freedom, and a common alpha or type 1 error rate is 0.05. Uh, so we're going to find where they intersect, and our critical value is going to be 11.07. Okay, so our critical value is 11.07, but we observed 12.41. Our value was bigger than the critical value, which is more weird. Since 12.4 is bigger than the critical value, we consider our results weird, and we reject the null hypothesis. And we conclude that the alternative is true, that this die is not fair based on the results that we observed. We think the die is rigged. Now we also have another type of chi-squared test for when we have two categorical variables. So this type of test is called a chi-squared test of independence or a chi-squared test of homogeneity. So we may have seen questions like this before with a two by two table uh, where we're asking, is the proportion of men and women who like watching football the same? So we ask a bunch of men and a bunch of women a yes or no question. Now again, we only have two answers here and two categories. So we could actually, for this type of data, do something called a two-proportion z-test. Uh, but if we have more than two categories, uh, we can no longer do a proportion test, but we can do a chi-squared test. So here we see some data on uh, categorical data where we have two variables, what country you live in and what your favorite food is. So just a note on this uh, language that we use, uh, a chi-squared test of independence and a chi-squared test of homogeneity are often taught as two different things, but these are really the exact same test. We're going to do the exact same calculations and everything, and we'll talk a little bit about why people talk about them differently. But again, nothing is going to be different that you actually do for these tests. So what do these tests do? What do chi-squared test of independence and homogeneity do? They test whether these two categorical variables are independent. And this is going to be our null hypothesis, that they are independent. So let's get some practice stating the null hypothesis for a chi-square test of independence or homogeneity. Okay, so again, we have two variables here, country that you live in and favorite food. Our null hypothesis is going to be that the country that you live in and the favorite food are independent. Now, another way to state this 
is that the distribution of food preferences is the same for each country, right? So independence means they have nothing to do with each other, right? Your country you live in doesn't affect your favorite food. And that's the same thing as saying that the food preferences are the same for each country. Okay, so this is the language of independence, and this is the language of homogeneity, meaning sameness. Here's another example. We have university that you attend and college major. Our null hypothesis is that the college major is independent of which college you attend. Now, how would we state this in the language of homogeneity? We would say that the distribution of majors is the same for each college. Right? The distribution of major preferences is the same for each college. And one more practice, uh, we have a country of, that you live in and favorite sport. So for independence, uh, it's usually pretty easy. We just say country that you live in is independent of what your favorite sport is. And how would we state this in the language of homogeneity? We would say the distribution of sports preferences is the same for each country. And these mean the same thing. Okay, so the homogeneity language has a nice visualization uh, that we can imagine in the table. Okay, so here we have a table of uh, gender and uh, favorite color. So, you know, it might be easier to use the wording of chi-square independence, that gender is independent of favorite color, but homogeneity has this nice visualization we can see, all right? So when we think of the fact that is the distribution of color preferences the same for each gender, we can see that by looking at the columns of this table. Right? So clearly, the numbers here for men and women are not the same. But if we notice, all the women's numbers are twice as much as the men's numbers. Okay, So it's not really that the distribution is different. They are the same. It's just that we happened to ask twice as many women. The rows or the columns will be proportional to each other. All right? So the men's and women's data is not exactly the same, obviously. But the distribution is the same because every number in the women's column is exactly double the men's column. And that means the proportion of men and women who like each color is the same. But we just happened to interview twice as many women. So clearly with this data, the distribution for men and women is exactly the same. So we would not reject the null hypothesis here, right? We would say, yes, this does look like it's independent. This does look like the distribution is the same for men and women. Now, how do we actually do this test? So just like the goodness of fit test, we will need to calculate expected counts. Now, we don't have a predefined distribution, like one sixth of all uh, die rolls are gonna be each possible option. Um, but in a way, it's actually gonna be easier to compute the expected counts for these tests um, because it's going to be, to be the same calculations involved for every single test because we're always testing independence. Um, so we're always gonna follow the exact same steps. Okay, so here is our table of country versus favorite food. And you'll notice we also have the margins of the table, right? So these are just the totals um, of the rows, right? This is how many people like hamburgers, how many like escargot, how many like pasta, how many people from the US, how many people from France, how many people from Italy, and we have 100 people in total. So these are the margins of the table. They're not really part of our main data set, which is just contained in the middle here. Uh, but they help us summarize the data. But let's pretend that we don't have any data in the middle of this table. There are so many ways we could attempt to fill in this table. It seems really, really hard. How could we go about filling this table in to get our expected counts? But what if we assumed the variables were independent? Okay, and this is going to be our null hypothesis for this test. Okay, well, the probability of living in the USA is 40 out of 100, right, or 0.4. And the probability of liking escargot is 20 out of 100, or 0.2. And a basic rule of probability tells us that if A and B are independent, the probability of A and B is the probability of A times the probability of B. So the probability of being from the USA and liking escargot should be 40 out of 100 times 20 out of 100. So this is the probability of being an escargot-loving American if country and food preference were independent. So we have 100 people. And the expected number of people is just the probability multiplied by 100, right? So the expected number of escargot-loving Americans should be the probability of being an escargot-loving American, which is this, times 100. And we'll notice that the hundreds on top and bottom will always cancel out. And what we're left with is 40 times 20 over 100, or 8. Another way we could see this is that these numbers multiplied by each other mean that the probability 
of being from the USA and liking escargot is 0 0.8. And what is 0 0.8? 8% uh, of 100? Well, it's, it's 8. Okay, so that's the same calculation. So this is actually the formula we're going to use uh, to calculate expected counts always. We're going to multiply the row total times the column total over the total total, right? Which is what we did here, right? When we wanted to find the number of S cargo loving Americans, we multiplied the row total of 20 times the column total of 40 and divided by the total total of 100. Okay, so let's try to do this one more time. How many Italian pasta lovers do we expect? Okay, so how many Italian pasta lovers do we expect if they're independent? Well, we're just going to multiply the row total times the column total over the total total. 45 times 35 over 100, and we get 15.75. Okay, and again, these numbers don't have to be whole numbers, uh, you'll often see decimals because they're just what we're expecting on average. And we can continue to fill out the entire interior of the table this way using this simple formula. Okay, so now we have our expected data and our observed data. Okay, and we see things don't quite match up. Uh, we expected to see eight escargot loving Americans, uh, but there were uh, zero uh, in our sample of real data. Likewise, uh, we only expected 14 people in the U.S. to like hamburgers, but there were 25, which is much more than we expected. And we only expected 15.75 pasta lovers, but there were really 25 in Italy. So how do these compare? Well, again, we're going to compute a chi-squared statistic. And for all nine of these numbers, right, in the interior of the table, again, we're not going to use the margins, we're going to sum up the observed minus expected squared over expected, right? Uh, the first number here is going to be 25 observed hamburgers minus 14 squared over what we expected, which was 14. And we're going to do that for all nine boxes. And when we do that, we're going to get 52.5. But again, we have to define the degrees of freedom. And the degrees of freedom for this two-dimensional table is just going to be the number of rows minus one times the number of columns minus one. And again, we're not going to think about the margins of the table, right? So this is a three by three table. There are three levels of each variable, right? Three possibilities for each variable. Uh, so three minus one is two, and three minus one is two. So we're going to multiply two by two and get four. So we're going to have four degrees of freedom here. And we're going to look in our chi-square table with four degrees of freedom, alpha equals 0.05, and we're going to get our critical value of 9.48 or we'll just round it to 9.5. Okay, so our null hypothesis was that food preference and country of origin are independent. The alternative hypothesis is just the opposite, that they are not independent. Our critical value, our cutoff for being too weird, was 9.5, and we observed 52 and a half. 52 and a half is m so much weirder than 9.5 that I can't even draw it in this picture. So we are going to reject the null hypothesis. We think that these things, food preference and country of origin, are not independent, which we could see in our data, right? The people from France preferred escargot, and the Americans preferred hamburgers, and the Italians preferred pasta. Food preference depends on what country you are from. And this was pretty obvious just by looking at the data, as we talked about. And remember, we also could have phrased this question in the language of homogeneity or sameness. We could have said that the distribution of favorite foods is the same for each country, right? And then we're kind of looking at this table uh, in terms of the columns, right? This is the food preference for USA. This is the food preference for France. And we can see that it's not the same, right? More people like hamburgers in the USA than in France or in Italy. So again, we would reject the null hypothesis and conclude that it's not the same for each country. We would reach the same exact conclusion. We use the same calculations, the same degrees of freedom, the same everything. We just word them a little differently. So, so why do we have two names for the same test? Well, this seems to be sort of a historical artifact from the use of the test in different fields. And some people still draw this distinction. The language of independence is sometimes more natural when we're collecting a simple random sample of data. So we collect uh, a whole bunch of people and we categorize them according to these two variables, and we're asking, are those two variables independent? However, if we were going to collect a stratified sample, right, separately go out and get some people from France, some people from US, some people from Italy, um, then it might be more natural 
uh, to use the language of homogeneity, to say we collected data from these three different countries, and we think these three different countries are the same. Um, so uh, that's sort of the major difference is the phrasing of the language and also the type of sampling. So a simple random sample or a stratified random sample for homogeneity, um, an experiment, because we're also predefining the groups, it might make sense to talk about the two groups being the same, uh, which would be homogeneity. Okay, but at the end of the day, if the test involve all of the same calculations and we draw the same conclusions, I think we can safely say that they are the same test, uh, regardless of what a statistics textbook might tell us. Um, now, of course, uh, if you're taking a statistics class right now and your teacher wants you to differentiate between these, or if you're taking the AP stats class, uh, definitely, uh, you know, call them uh, what the book wants you to call them. Uh, one more thing. Uh, this test, as we talked about, like many tests, is an approximation and relies on having a big enough sample size. So for all of these tests, including the goodness of fit test, to be accurate, uh, most of these expected counts should be at least five. Okay, so it does not matter at all what the observed counts are, right? We have zeros here, uh, that does not matter. Uh, but most of these expected counts should be at least five. Thanks for watching. Please like and subscribe to learn more statistics.